Hello, and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I am joined by Mr. Tim Carmen. Tim, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. I appreciate you having me. Yeah, man, you are an interesting guy because you're you're in the uh, really great band uh, GA20, which Thank are yeah. awesome. I'm, I'm a big fan of you guys and have, have grown to be more of a fan in the last couple of months since we kind of started planning this. Um, yeah, nice. But beyond that, you you are a drummer's drummer. I mean, you're first off, you're a phenomenal player, but you're also a great educator and um, author. Uh, and you've got a number of books out. Uh, I'll start kind of in reverse order and then end up with what we're talking today. But uh, the cool. Shape Beat series, which yep. I want to hear more about that later. And then Groove Systems, Haynes Isms, and then Phillyisms is the most uh, the most recent one which the isms series is kind of what we're here to talk about with yep. an emphasis on Philly, Philly Joe Jones. So, um, Tim, like maybe explain what the concept of the isms is, and then we'll dive deeper into uh, more about Philly. So, uh, Perfect. yeah, take it away. Awesome. Well, I appreciate the kind words. Thank you very much. Yeah. So I, I actually have the definition of an ism here. Uh, it says an ism is a manner of action or behavior characteristic of a specified person or thing. But in our case, you know, we're talking about a manner of action or a behavioral characteristic of a person or essentially what I view it as it's what a particular drummer that I might look back at in history, what they like to do when they play, like what's a characteristic of Philly Joe Jones or what's a characteristic of Roy Haynes that when you hear that particular characteristic, you're like, that's Roy Haynes, that's Philly Joe Jones, yeah, that's Tony Williams, whatever. Um, and I kind of came up with a concept, and it's based on the famous Bruce Lee quote, where he's, he says, I fear not the person who has practiced 10,000 kicks once, but I fear the person who has practiced one kick 10,000 times. So the basic idea for the ISM series was to study a particular jazz drummer who, you know, kind of paved the way for other drummers and dig into their brain a little bit, transcribe them, and figure out what their particular characteristic soloing style would be or like a piece of vocabulary. So the first person I did that with was was Roy Haynes. I figured out what he kind of liked to do. Um, and the, the, the idea was to take that piece of vocabulary and kind of milk it for for all it's worth, you know, create musical mileage out of one piece of vocabulary, you could sure. say. So just to give kind of a broad, this isn't really a biography episode about uh, Philly Joe Jones, because it'd be cool to do that. I'll, I'll do that at some point, but I'm sure there's yeah. someone who's written a book who totally. is an absolute, you know, knows everything about him, which um, yeah. we've discussed this and we're not going to go down that road right now. But, you know, the in, in, in a couple sentences, can you describe who Philly Joe Jones is for people who aren't familiar, uh, yeah. some of his highlights and uh, and then we'll go deeper you know, beyond that. Yeah. Yeah. He was, well, he was born in Germantown district of Philadelphia in 1923. So he grew up in Philadelphia. That's kind of where he got his start. Um, when he, he went into the war, world war two, and he came back in 1944. And around that time he moved to New York city. Um, and essentially I think when people think of Philly Joe Jones, they'll automatically jump to his time with miles Davis. Uh, in the fifties, he was part of the quintet with, with Coltrane and and he kind of defined I'd say the hard bop swing era of the late 50s and the early 60s. Um so that was kind of his 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 period and he yeah. also in my opinion defined like the language of soloing in that time. He invented a lot of vocabulary that people today are still using and that drummers after him, you know, Elvin Jones and people like that took inspiration from. And he played until he passed away in uh, 1985, but he really kind of defined that period yeah. in, uh, in jazz drumming. So Yeah. I mean, he was born a hundred years ago, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is That's the great, yeah, exactly. Crazy. He was. We literally, I mean, would have celebrated his 100th birthday on July 15th. Yeah. About a month ago. Wow. Yeah. To when we're recording this right now. I mean, uh, so he's kind of in the era of Buddy Rich, I guess, was like 1917. I think Gene Krupa mm -hmm. was like 1909. He's like, I think. right. Yeah, he's right in that era of these like that first wave of or maybe that would be I guess that would be the first wave of of jazz like legends, modern. Totally. And, and it it also helps that we have like more modern recordings of them to study. Yeah, 
Yeah. You know, that's another reason. I mean, I love that period of the 50s and early 60s because recording technology kind of was advancing at that point. So we could hear a little bit more of what some of these drummers like Philly Joe Jones were playing. Yeah. Um, so I, th- I think it's a really, you know, interesting period. Um, and he, I mean, he was highly influenced by Cozy Cole and uh, Max Roach. He, he actually studied with Cozy Cole and he hung out with Max, Max Roach a lot. So he took inspiration from a lot of those, those guys. And Yeah. How would you explain to someone the importance of Philly Joe Jones, um, maybe his, his impact on drumming? I know you said that his, it's really about his, his soloing style and things like that. But I, I think his swing feel as well, though, for me, uh, he defined the swing feel of the 50s. Okay. You know, the way, the way he, pl- he played a lot with ba- the bass player, uh, Paul Chambers. They played in a lot of groups together. And I think the two of them, their feel was the foundation for, for jazz in the 50s. I mean, they played yeah. on so many heavy records that today we, we study. Um, so yeah, I think obviously his solo vocabulary was, was revolutionary and really unique. And, uh, he had a lot of, you know, a lot of personality in what he played, which, you know, I think is really cool and really difficult to achieve that. So I'd say his solo vocabulary and the way he swung yeah. were the, the two things that really defined. And he also, he played with, uh, it was interesting to, to dig into his history a little bit and just, you know, Miles Davis talked about like how he Philly just brought fire to the bandstand. He had a really energetic, often loud, fiery style of, of playing drums, um, sure. which also was unique for him, I think. Yeah. Yeah, so. absolutely. Well, do you think that Philly Joe Jones, uh, like, I feel like he gets credit amongst drummers, but he's a, he flies a little bit under the radar of, of uh, you know, there's the household names that everyone knows, but mm-hmm. I think doing your book is going to give more credit where credit is due and help get his name out there. I mean, do you yeah, think he I gets so. enough credit or he's a little bit of I an think, underdog? Well, I think within, if you talk to jazz drummers, yeah, I think he's, he's up there on everyone's list that I talk to at least of, you know, the legends. Sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think he is overlooked by some of the earlier guys you mentioned, like the Buddy Riches and the people who were more, I guess, showmen or, you know, they'd take yeah. long solos, which Philly could do. And in my opinion, uh, his solo style speaks to me more than some of those other drummers uh, because it's, it's, it's very musical. Not that the other guys aren't, but, but yeah, I think, you know, I think he, could, he can be overlooked by musicians or drummers who maybe aren't focused on the jazz world. And I think he's, an incredibly pers- incredibly important icon to to check out you know everyone i think needs to check out philly joe johnson yeah he inspired a lot of people so yeah for sure i think there's the the musical solo goes a long way and is yeah uh we we all like to be kind of like blasted with an amazing ripping drum solo but sometimes it's it's nice to have a little more uh yeah. tonality and 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 music to it but another thing i can say yeah. too regarding like what he did for the for soloing he had an incredibly like rudimental approach to soloing he had all of the rudiments under his hands hmm. and he had the ability to orchestrate those around the drums and kind of make them his own and if you listen to interviews he talks about you know the importance of the rudiments and studying the rudiments and that's kind of how he developed his style of soloing um, i know he studied with charlie wilcoxon and he he went through all of those solos in his book and a lot of that comes out in the way philly soloed soloed himself so i think that's also an important you know thing to to know because he taught philly joe jones taught a lot of drummers later on in his life um, and that's what he did when he when he taught he he had his his students go through the rudiments and rudimental solos and how to apply those onto the drum set. So sure. All right. Now to, to create this book, which again mm-hmm. is Philly isms, uh, through yep. Hudson music. First off, I love the cover that you did. The artwork for these is just super cool and very yeah, yeah, like yeah. timely and it just fits totally. with the vibe. Did you do yeah. that or no, I didn't actually, this is a good moment to shout out. This is this guy, Jamie Brywick. He, his, uh, company is called B side graphics. Um, and I reached out to him cause he's done some work on some of the, my own jazz trios releases. He's, he's designed posters and covers and stuff like that. So he has just like a really cool old school, like jazz 
art style. Yeah, so I it was is, like, exactly. This, this is this is perfect. And it, when I, you know, thought of the concept for this book and the the style of the cover, you know, Gary Chafee's pattern series, you know, it, it's such a unique cover that he just changes the color of from book to book. So that was kind of something I had in mind. I was like, oh, I want to make it one cover that's unique and vintage looking and stands out. And yeah. then I can change the color and uh, as I go through each drummer, pretty yeah. much. Yeah, I think it's smart because it sticks yeah. out and it's clearly it's clearly you. Um, now, let's talk a little bit about how you, you know, what your process was to break down these styles, because it's it's true. I mean, if you if we look at ourselves, we find when we sit down on the kit, we have our go to things. We have our, our vocabulary that we like to do. And uh, some totally. days that can drive you insane thinking, OK, stop playing the same thing. <laughs> yeah. But there's yeah, yeah, yeah. there's there's like there's certain things that you can always tell in a, in a great way of. I can you can close your eyes and just hear that person playing and knowing mm -hmm. it's them. And that's something yeah. that's very important. So and I think that's yeah. everyone's goal at the end of the day is to get to that point. And, you know, where someone can listen to you play for 15, 30 seconds and be like, oh, that's that's him. Or, yeah. you know, I think that's incredible when if you can get there. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you have any uh, I mean, as as a educator and author, what would be some tips that you would say that people could work on? Or, or can you work on that? Or does it need to naturally happen to get your own ism? I think uh, one thing that's helped me a lot, well, first of all, play out as much as possible, play shows. Yeah. And then, the, but more important than that is record yourself while you do that. Like I, I'll film myself. I used to, I do it a little bit, but not as much as I used to. And and it's like watching game footage, you know what I mean? Sure. And and what I'd like to do is I'll be like, oh man, I do that a lot. That's kind of cool. Sometimes when I see myself and listen, I can, oh, that's kind of, that's, maybe that's my ism. Yeah. But more important than that though, is you can hear the things that you do that you maybe don't like, and you can yeah. cut that out of your playing. It's like cutting the fat off type of thing. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I think filming and recording yourself is the most important thing you can do. And that's true with anything. Like I find that with the podcast, I, you know, I don't, often listen back to old episodes because I'm d working on the next one all the time. But you find that like, yeah, OK, time to stop doing that or time to stop saying that thing or yeah, uh, it's painful. It's painful. Or some <laughs> friendly really person is. will email you and say, stop doing that. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, man. So so then going back to the original thing we were talking about there about um, what was do day one of working on, you know, you pick someone to study the ism. What mm -hmm. is that process like for you to learn Philly isms? Totally. Uh, I'll say this, the Roy Haynes, the Haynesism, the piece of vocabulary for him was a little bit easier for me to come by. The Phillyism was really difficult to pick because he does so many things or he did so many things that are really unique and interesting. He had a lot of little little tools that he would pull out. Um, the way I came acro across or the way I pinned down this particular pattern, which at the end of the day, it's basically the paradiddle rudiment. Uh, and he liked to play it in a nine stroke sticking. Um, and I chose that one because I noticed that he utilized that in different subdivisions. You know, he played it as an eighth note, as a 16th note. He'd vary the paradiddle sticking in a, in a triplet subdivision. He also orchestrated it by playing accents or moving it to the toms in sure. a lot of interesting ways. Um, I talk about one thing in the book is... I call it extending or shortening the phrase. So, you know, I, as I mentioned, the ism is a nine note paradiddle sticking. But what he would do is he would play five note groupings of the paradiddle starting with his left hand. So it'd be huh. like left, right, left, left, and then end with an accented right. And he would move that around the drums. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. and then he would, there's a lot of, I could go for a long time about it. But essentially, I noticed that he loved the paradiddle and he loved to come up with interesting ways to use the paradiddle around the kit. And that's yeah. how I decided to stick with that. Yeah. One thing I will say though, this is something I did with Phillyism that I didn't do with Haynesism is I have a section in the beginning of the book where I talk about nine other phrases that Philly liked to use. And I kind of define those as well. And then throughout the book, when I put together phrases with the paradiddle-ism, I'll pepper in some of those other examples as well, just so you get some, you know, other interesting vocab you can kind of mess around with. So. Sure, sure. And I, it says here that you also like there's points where like, like, note the X on beat three signifies a stick shot 
mm -hmm. or right stick on the left stick. That's the classic yep. kind of jazz. Just yeah, like, totally. Pow. And that that was another. I mean, Miles, I I read used to say to the drummers in his group after Philly, like do the Philly thing, and he'd be talking about hitting that stick shot like that. So that yeah. was you know Philly loved to do that. Yeah. This episode is brought to you by Mono. Mono makes extremely durable and stylish cases and bags that are made for musicians and creators on the go. I've been using the Mono M80 Classic Flyby Ultra Backpack for the last two years, and this is hands down the nicest backpack I've ever owned. It has tons of space that holds your computer, interface, microphone, hard drive, MIDI controller, or anything you need on the road. It's waterproof, full of protective padding, has multiple storage compartments, and is very comfortable to wear. My favorite part about the Flyby Ultra Backpack, though, is how you can unzip the back portion of the bag, and then you have a second, thin, streamlined backpack that has plenty of room for laptop and accessories. And it has a very cool and sleek design. I use just this slim part of the bag all the time when walking around drum shows or going to meetings, and then I just zip the full backpack back together, load up my gear, and hit the road. Check out the Mono M80 Classic Flyby Ultra Backpack and all the great Mono gear through Sweetwater at the link in the description of this episode. I've used this backpack every day for about two years now, and it looks pretty much brand new. But if you order through Sweetwater, you also get the peace of mind of having a free two-year full warranty. Thanks to Mono for sponsoring this episode. I am not an expert on the history of Miles Davis and his drummers, which there are many iconic ones. Mm -hmm. Philly was early on. In yeah, Miles. he was like the first iconic. Well, and then Jimmy Cobb was one of the earlier ones, too. Okay. But, you know, the three are Jimmy Cobb, Philly Joe Jones, Tony Williams. Yeah. Those are kind of the that people think about. So yeah, exactly. He played with lots of other incredible drummers, but, you know, the the quintets, that's, you know. Yeah. Awesome. And I'm looking through here. So so this is a pretty extensive uh, book. How do you think that people <laughs> it's a should? Beast. How do you think people should <laughs> approach this book? I mean, do you need to be a master at at reading, or what level is, or what level of of, of that's a great question drummer slash re reading ability are you are you going for here? Well, the the book comes with video where I play through a lot of the exercises. Cool. So, I mean, being able to read definitely will help while using this book, but there is a video to go along that people who aren't too comfortable with reading can watch. Yeah, and kind of get an idea from. Um, and I honestly think this book is great for beginners, intermediate drummers to advanced drummers, maybe more the intermediate realm. Um, also for people who, you know, maybe play jazz a little bit, but are really trying to dig into it more. I think, you know, as a drummer who's touring in a blues group and playing rock and roll and stuff like that, I've always studied jazz, but it's not something that I get to do every day. Yeah. So for me, this was a book that I wanted to work through on my own time too to just get better at at playing jazz um so sure. i think it's great for that because it's the whole point is to introduce you know a piece of vocabulary that somebody can absorb and the goal is you want it to come out naturally and organically on the bandstand you know you don't yeah. want to be just regurgitating information it you want to make it your own and that's the whole purpose of this book yeah so. yeah so obviously you know, you being kind of in a blues, really cool rock band, you, you, it is beneficial to study things like this, mm -hmm. take it and put it in any genre of music. I feel like you could play like metal, any of the many totally. he heavy metal genres and take things like this. Yeah. That's one of the things I love most about drumming is like, I don't know. I mean, I we talk about this in a lot of episodes about how drums are special, but there's not many instruments I imagine where if you're learning you know, classical violin, and then you hear like someone playing like an acrylic 80s kind of like electric violin. They're just different. But with drums, you can take this and apply it to like your, you know, thrash band. Totally. And, you know, take these concepts and, and get a lot out of it. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, the isms in Phillyism is a paradiddle. You know what I yeah, mean? It's, so it's sure. like there's so much you can do with the paradiddle, you know, yeah. in, in any style of, of music. Yeah. So. Yeah, I love the paradiddle, and and it's good Man. that he's doing it. I mean, it's oh, he yeah, all over the place. And he there's a really interesting sticking that he did. It's like a variation of the paradiddle uh, in the triplet subdivision that I talk about in the book as well. That he moves around a lot, and or he moved around. So it's it's there's a there's a lot to a lot to do with it. And again, as we mentioned, it's the book is 230 pages, um, and <laughs> a lot. the way it's a, it's a big book. I put a lot of time into yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> Congrats, um, yeah. The way I recommend going through it, though, is you don't necessarily need to go in order. 
it's like you can go through the introduction and basically get the general concept sure. and then the chapters are organized by subdivision so part one is the ism in a 16th note subdivision part two is the ism in an eighth note part three is in a triplet an eighth note triplet and then part four basically we, we start combining the subdivisions and then part five this is a cool concept um basically we take the ism and you play it while singing heads of popular jazz tunes you know again this all comes back to stuff that i want to personally work on to help me become a better drummer and you know when you're playing a tune sometimes it can be hard to have the vocabulary come out that you've been working on but if you practice vocabulary with a tune in mind on the bandstand it happens a lot more naturally i think if that makes sense you know? yeah no absolutely and if even if you practice something at home it's and you don't use directly that thing when you're out playing a show it's mm -hmm. still helping it's still time on the kit as Steve yeah. Smith says, it's all time on the kit. It's totally it's it's just very beneficial. And yeah, just just looking at Philly, some some photos here online. He was primarily a Gretsch guy, wasn't he? Yes, he was. Yeah, yeah. there's a some yeah. picture of him on like a premiere kit. That might have been a rental or something. But um, yeah, yeah, that's cool. man. Again, Gretsch I'll, I'll let some this, I'm sure yes. someone else will have more info on, on that type of stuff. But yeah, <laughs> sure. I don't want to go too far down that. And someone yeah, said, yeah, no, yeah. he played this at this point. <laughs> exactly. But, exactly. Um, well, so Philly, yes. Then, then Roy Haynes. I mean, how would you break down? I know we're talking primarily about the new book and Philly Joe Jones, mm -hmm. but how would how would you kind of boil down Roy Haynes into that? Like you said, Philly Joe Jones loved paradiddles. Yeah. What about Roy Haynes? How did that? So the ism that I came up with for Roy Haynes, uh, it's a phrase that people vocalize sometimes. Uh, it's did it and did it and did it and did it, which is essentially two he would do it as stick shots you know on the snare yeah and then a kick drum and he would play it as a triplet that that goon that that goon that that goon that that goon he loved to use that he loved to move it around the set he would play it also in different subdivisions and permutate it which basically means he would start it in different points in the measure um so that that phrase for roy haynes is probably he's definitely my top favorite jazz drummer or if if not one of the top yeah. Um, I've, I've listened and transcribed him since I was in high school. He was the first guy I really oh, wow. grabbed onto. So he was, a, I, I knew that was a thing he did a lot. So it was a little easier to just write off, be like, yeah, this is the one I'm going to do for him. So yeah, absolutely. And he's 98 yeah. years old right now. So yeah, we're lucky, still to, going. lucky to have him around. Yep. And, uh, have you gotten any feedback? Did he, did he respond at all to your book? I don't think he's, no, I don't think he's seen it yet. I'd love to, I'd love to hear his thoughts on it though. I mean, he's, yeah. he's a, he's absolutely a hero of mine and it's incredible too like how he's managed to you know stay relevant in every style of music basically since he started playing and he's also a fellow bostonian i'm from boston so i, okay, I yeah you know, I, I like that too yeah, yeah absolutely <laughs> uh yeah. probably the last thing you want to hear as you've just finished this massive mega book is well what's next but but like That's funny, yeah <laughs> Yeah, what I have some would, other ideas. <laughs> what would be something that like that you 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 would want to? Who's another drummer? Because obviously, you know, you want to keep the series going and all that stuff. Who would be your next kind of uh, drummer to uh, to attack? Yeah, I have a couple in mind, and I also I love when people recommend them too. It's cool, but yeah, uh, I, Max Roach is definitely somebody. And yeah. then another person I've been thinking about is, uh, which would be a little bit different, is uh, Idris Muhammad, hmm. and uh, kind of come up with he has some isms within his grooves that he would use so i think it'd be interesting to kind of dig into that a little bit yeah that's another another version so yeah and then absolutely. bill stewart he's another person who i love and i've thought about doing it with too but yeah you know i i'm, I'm still juggling a few different ideas i gotta talk more with rob wallace at hudson music and and we'll, we'll figure something out so yeah I mean, it's a cool concept of of books, and that's one thing that I like about uh, just anything that's like, like everything in the world has typically been done in some capacity. But this is yeah. kind of a very uh, unique idea, and you know, I think that it's it stands out as being like, oh, that's really cool. I want to learn totally. more about that. How how has the reception been since you've released it? Since it's, since you've been releasing the series, it's been great, actually. Uh, I was shocked and really happy to find out that Haynesism was nominated uh, the Modern Drummer Readers Poll, yeah. like best education product in 2022. Congrats. Um, 
thank you. It was, I mean, I, it was crazy. I, I didn't expect it at all. And I was on a list of people like John Riley and, you know, David Garibaldi and all of these people that I've looked up, Dave Desenzo for years. It was like all yep. of those names and then me. <laughs> I mean, I'm like, this doesn't seem right, but that's Well, cool. you deserve it for doing oh, all the, the work. And, and honestly, yeah. it's, I think there's a little bit too of like, those guys are icons and legends and 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 known for being uh, an author. But for you being, I mean, you've got some books under your belt, but for being a younger guy who's kind of new to that scene totally, relatively, yeah. it's cool. Yeah. And I'm glad they're they're showcasing uh, what what's what's happening with it. Who ended yeah. up winning? I don't I don't know yet, actually. I think oh, they announced in September. Wow. Yeah. OK, so yeah, that's that's yeah. very fresh. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's new. I just just found out about it, I guess, last month. So it's cool. Yeah. 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 So. Um, I was looking on your website and and mm -hmm. obviously we can talk more about the isms and stuff, but I, I as a, you know, dad of young kids was very interested in your uh, shape beat series. Totally. Yeah. What's up with that? Because drum notation and music can be boiled down pretty simply to just shapes. And yeah. this means this. This means this. How, what's the whole what's the story with that? Yeah, this the, there's a funny backstory to this book, actually. Um, so it'll be kind of a little bit of a sidestep, but I'll get into it. Uh, so I used to teach kids a lot around the Boston area. And I also at the time was studying with Gary Chafee, who is a legend and uh, yeah. was a great mentor for me. Um, Gary basically called me up one day and he was like, my grandson Tiernan, who's six years old, wants to learn how to play the drums. I don't, Gary was like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to, how to teach a six year old. He's like, I'm <laughs> used to teaching Berkeley students and, and above. Yeah. So he's like, why don't you come over in my place and teach him lessons in my basement? Um, and I was obviously pretty intimidated because it's Gary Chafee, but I'm like, sure. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. So basically I started teaching his grandkid. Um, and I had come up with this method, be the shape beat method, because I was noticing that you know, four-year-olds and five-year-olds were starting to, you know, their parents wanted them to learn how to play drums. And that's me. You know, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But they don't know, you know, if you think about it, music notation, it's, it's basically fractions, it's math. It's a lot of, a lot of things like that. And I'm like, yeah. a little kid doesn't know what that is. So, no. but you know, a four-year-old knows what a triangle is. A four-year-old knows what a square is and a circle. Yeah. So the shape beat method is essentially if you see a triangle, it's play the hi-hat. If you see a square, it's play the snare drum. And if you see a circle, it's the bass drum. Uh, and if two shapes are on top of each other, you play them at the same time. So I basically just boiled down the notation to that basic you know, element. Yeah. So I was using the method with uh, Gary's grandkid and he was kind of like, you know, over my shoulder, like, what are you working on with him? You know, and he was, he was awesome. He was, he basically was like, man, this is really cool. Like, mm -hmm. I love this concept you should put a book out. Um, and he was connected with Alfred Music because he put out his books through them. So he, he essentially set the whole thing up, introduced me to Alfred, and that's how I put together the first book, Shape Beats. So. Wow. I mean, as a dad of a four-year-old and a one-year-old, but of a four-year-old who like likes to sit on the drums, but it's almost like this, like, um, well, let me show you how to do this. And then there's just this, ah, like going crazy. I don't want you to show me. I could mm -hmm. see setting this down and just kind of like walking away because yeah. like there's there's really this uh, maybe it's just my son or little boys of like uh, someone else showing them something. It's it's different when it's your dad. You want to be just silly totally. and crazy, but it, like yeah, I could see him figuring this out on his own, and uh, I will probably yeah. order it because that this seems it's, like a perfect thing for that age. Yeah, I I had a, a ton of success using it, um, and I paired it with every section has a list of songs that work for those particular beats because cool. that's another thing that you know kids want to play music so like the first song and a lot of people teach this is like we will rock you which oh, would man. be a circle circle and a square or bass bass that snare too many times yeah every day exactly. it's, can we play this and it's like yeah, yeah i guess yeah. <laughs> so the shape beat stuff works great for that um and yeah i had a lot of success with it i actually put out on my own like kind of like a sequel to the shape beats method it's called shape beats drum notation simplified that's also for adults because it was i was teaching adults and they uh they kind of got wind of a lot of my older students got wind of the shape beats method and they were like can we just use that they're like you know they're, they just wanted to play music and they're like I, i'm 45 years old i'm not looking to learn <laughs> notation can we just yeah you know yeah and then some of my those students actually you know were like you you should make this book also for adults 
So I did that as well. I have another one for, for Smart. adults too. Yeah. yeah, because it's daunting. And I mean, I've got a background and I went did drum lessons for years and I can read, but when you get out mm -hmm. of it, you sort of like forget. And then you look at a page of giant page of notation and you're like, God, I just forget how to do this. And yeah. it's it's nice to see that to get back into it. So it's all, overwhelming. For all, sure, of the, <laughs> all of those are still available, right? For yep, yep. purchase. Okay. All those are out. Yep. Good to know. I'll link everything yep. in the description. And then cool. um, talk about your book, Groove Systems. What's yeah. that? So Groove Systems, I worked on for probably three or four years. Um, and it's kind of taking the concept of, you know, the book Four Way Coordination, um, Marvin Dahlgren's book, where, you know, you have these series of, you know, of notation that go for each of your limbs, essentially, that you're combining in interesting ways. So what I did with Groove Systems is I picked 10 styles of music and I transcribed, you know, let's say Afrobeat, that's one of the styles. I transcribed the hi-hat patterns that I found in Afrobeat, the snare patterns that I found in Afrobeat, and the bass drum patterns. And I labeled the hi-hat patterns A, B, C, whatever. Mm. Snare patterns, A, B, C, bass drum patterns, same type of thing. And what, what you can do with that is take, you know, hi-hat A and combine it with high with snare drum B and then run it through all the bass drum combinations. So oh, cool. it's a vocabulary method that's supposed to accomplish two things. It helps with your coordination, but it helps with coordination in specific styles of music. Because one nice. thing that I yeah. felt when I would work through some of the coordination books is like, oh, these are really interesting combinations, but I can't use them in any musical setting per se. So I yeah. wanted to come up with a book where, you know, you're killing two birds with one stone, essentially. Yeah. And I mean, this obviously coming before the other ones, I see this as a bit of a predecessor to the isms because you're also kind of looking at uh, Purdy variations, Gad yep. Mozambique, Alan's Afrobeat. Mm -hmm. So you like to look at the the famous styles of drummers that people are familiar with. Totally. Yeah. And break them down, which I think, yeah. why not? You know, it's yeah. we all like these people. We all want to know how they play. Why dance yeah. around it? You know? Yeah. And I, I, to, it's funny to the Going back to your first question, it's like how I came up with the ism concept. Well, the, to me, the Groove Systems book has so much information in it, which is fantastic. But sometimes I, you know, I would step back and be like, this is a little bit, it's overwhelming. There's a lot of stuff. And when I came up with the idea for isms, I basically was like, I want to do the opposite. I want to have the least amount of information in here or the, you know, the smallest amount of vocabulary, but utilize that vocabulary in the largest amount of ways, if that makes sense, you know, yeah. really milk, milk it for everything. Yeah. Cause I, I think, cause I've never really seen a book do that. So that was, I thought an interesting idea. So no. And it, it kind of goes to the concept of like how drums can be very, very simple. If you look at it, just a paradiddle, mm -hmm. but the amount that you can pull out of like, like, it's just like how, how, you know, the, the two, four kind of money beat, you can play that and just be fine. You can play that for the rest of your life, but how you can just do so many things from a simple yeah. concept, literally to fill a, you know, 250 page totally. book or whatever. Yeah. We, I it's, also it's, think that's where the creativity comes from. Totally. I think too, it's, it's, you know, it's one thing. I always say this with my students. It's one thing to like be able to play a paradiddle. It's like, you know, whatever you can play the sticking, but to make it feel good and to use it musically and in the right moments, um is not easy to do so the whole point of this is you know to, to make it so you have to repeat this thing a ton of times more times than you probably want to but in doing so you're going to get a good grasp of it and it's going to be more musical and it's going to sound cleaner um, yeah it's just you know the same thing you take you know you teach a student like a basic eighth note rock beat and they're like this is easy i'm like well try playing that on a recording session for four minutes you know and exactly. make it feel good and in time and you know it's not easy. And no, that's a room full you, of people staring at you. Yeah, and if you get yeah. off your, yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. best drummers in the world can make a simple beat just feel amazing. And, you know, you want to hear that for hours. That's, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. It's like Steve Jordan. I mean, there's another mm -hmm. ism right there where something simple, yeah. you can just feel the way he's playing. And totally. And it's specifically him, but it's on paper, it's probably not that hard, but it's yeah, very, exactly. very cool. Yeah. yeah. Totally. Yeah. 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 So you, uh, make your living as a working drummer. Um, is there any tips or tricks or maybe things that people 
you know, don't think of if they if they want to commit, if they want to go from working, you know, a nine to five and gigging on the weekends and they want to take those steps to Mm -hmm. to make this more of a career, you know, maybe some things that they wouldn't think of or they should, you know, like things that you've learned over the years of doing this. um, Yeah. To make it a career. Yeah. Well, first thing I'd say is don't give up. Like if you really want to be doing it, um, it, it took me so long and I, and I did other jobs. I, well, I taught a lot and I worked at a coffee shop and I lived in LA for a bit. The first job I had out there was working at Halloween club, selling uh, Halloween costumes. And, you know, so there's <laughs> a lot cool. of ups. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. There's a lot of ups and downs and it's, it's a grind and you kind of just got to keep going. Um, but I'd been asked this before, I came up with a thing I called, it's kind of cheesy, but my RAFTS system, R-A-F-T-S, and it's like those, and they stand, like R stands for reliability, mm-hmm. you know, I think that seems obvious to a lot of people, but not a lot of people are reliable, especially in the musical world, you got to show up with all your gear, you got to be prepared for the gig, and then the the A of RAFTS is attitude, you have to, you have to have a good attitude, you, you want, you know, and... I remember people telling me this when I was younger and I didn't really buy into it, but when you're touring on the road, living with people, if you have a bad attitude, it doesn't matter how good you are at your instrument. No one's going to want to go on tour with you. Yeah. It sounds miserable. It's awful to be around a person like that. Yeah. yeah. So you got to be, you know, you got to be easy to get along with and you got to be excited to be there. Um, And then the F of rafts is feel in my opinion, you know, there are drummers out there who maybe have all the chops in the world, but when they ask to play a groove and make it feel good, maybe they're not the best at that. In my opinion, if you want to make a living as a drummer, I would focus more on feel than any of that other stuff. And then the T is time, like keeping good time, mm-hmm. which connects with feel as well. But you know that that takes a you know a lot of time to work on, but the. I think one of the best ways to get better at that is one practice with a metronome two, as I mentioned earlier, film all of your gigs. Cause you'll see, Oh shoot. I I rush when I do this or I drag, why am I dragging there? And you know, that's going to help get your time better. And then the last one, the S you could call social media or, or networking. Yeah. Unfortunately in this day and age, right. It's like, you know, it's not really my, personally my favorite thing to do but you you got to do it you, you know got to have a website um, yeah go out to shows and meet people you know network it's a it's a kind of a dirty word but it doesn't have to be because you know i love going out to see music so make an yeah. effort to do that and it's a good way to meet people in the music scene that you're in you yeah know? and make it fun i mean i agree completely where i i get it why i feel it too where i mean i have to work on social media stuff to promote the podcast mm-hmm. all the time, every day, yeah. every night, there's something. But it's also like I've met some of the coolest people in the world, and I've yeah. like had the chance to like have oh interact with someone I never would have before. And I mean, like I don't know, you probably found me through Instagram originally or something. Yeah, I totally, hundred percent. I've been listening to the podcast for a while. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's because of this, and it leads to that, and it's mm-hmm. oh, they seem like a cool person, and let's connect. So, so you know, I I agree that it can be a bummer, but like like you said, make the best of it. Go to the shows, yeah. make the connections. I mean, yeah. I, again, I have people that I've been friends with for five years now because of doing this. Totally, and it's incredible, and it's well, thanks that, to that. So, yeah, and that is the beauty of of the social media stuff is like personally like i love drum podcasts and i listen to them all the time me too uh i still you know discovered yours i listened to the big fat five podcast yep. working drummer podcast i'd hit that all of oh, those i'd hit know, that was my first i heard that was mine too yeah that yeah. was mine too yeah yeah which i still don't really know his name i think it's dave but <laughs> i believe yeah i think so but there's That's, some amazing you know yeah. and then you get to hear you know, I, I love hearing from drummers that I, you know, idolize. I love hearing their thoughts on things. So it's a really, yeah. it's a cool platform for sure. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and one thing just to jump back with, with how you've categorized this rafts, mm-hmm. uh, reliability, attitude, feel time and social media, the brain of a teacher is like, all right, I'm noticing that I'm doing something and I'm having these things happen. Mm-hmm. How can I put this into a simple way to then teach it to other people. Yeah. Clearly you've got the brain for this. And I think that's important to be able to, it's, it's fine if people don't have that brain, but if they can receive that and learn from it, but clearly you like to kind of like 
put things in a nice orderly box for people to yeah. be taught. I think yeah. that's really cool and very powerful. Oh, thank you, man. I appreciate it. Well, my mom's a teacher. I think for some reason that's, I probably got that from her. You know, it's how I yeah. like to, I like to organize things like that. So, yeah. yeah, it's helpful. I mean, there's all kinds of things that you can, the, the acronyms and things that are very helpful to remember and, and, and help you totally. keep things in track. But, um, so let's talk about your work with your band, man. I mean, you guys are, awesome. you guys are awesome. So GA 20, um, yep. I heard about you through Bruce Becker originally. I was trying to put my nice. finger on it, but so you've yeah. multiple things to talk about here, but you have worked with Bruce Becker. He turned yes. me on to you guys just in passing saying that he was working with you and you're the real deal. I mean, you're, you're awesome. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. Well, first of all, I want to say I love Bruce Becker and he's one of the best teachers I've ever studied with. And I'm not, he didn't tell me to do this, but in <laughs> all honest, honesty, like his, his technique lessons change the way I play drums. Hmm. And if anyone is listening and you want to be able to relax while you play, go study with Bruce Becker. He's a guru and yeah. So just wanted to say that because yeah. the guy's and he's a, a funny guy. He's a funny dude too. Yeah. He's great. <laughs> I love him. Yeah. Um but yeah he so I'm glad he introduced you to GA twenty. I appreciate that. Yeah, we're GA twenty is we're a relatively new band. We uh you know the band is made up of three people, Pat Faraday, Matthew Stubbs, and myself. Those two guys started the band in 2018, and then I joined like shortly after that. Um, and it's basically like a Chicago, we call ourselves like heavy blues. It is, But yeah. inspired by Chicago icons like um, Hound Dog Taylor and stuff like that. So it's... It's an interesting lineup, too, because it's two guitarists and myself, and one of the guitarists sings. So we don't have a bass player. It's, uh, you know, the way they do it, though, we're, we're, we're pretty loud. Basically, the drums are set up in the middle, and then to my right, we have Matt, and Matt has two guitar amps that are set up, and both of those are mic'd and on at all times. Wow. And then to my left, Pat has the same setup, two guitar amps <laughs> mic'd at all times. So I'm getting like blasted by oh, man. guitar. Thankfully, they're both incredible guitarists, so it's yeah. a lot of fun. But yeah, we, we pack a punch when, when you see us live for sure. So. That's awesome. The the use of I did that on a recording session once. Uh, I was working as an engineer on it, but my my old boss was the one who set this all up. But I did the recording of, of some of it, but it was five guitar amps in the studio through one. So it'd be like a Mesa or Mesa. Yeah. Like three Marshalls, a uh, a Vox, all this at one time. And the power of combining multiple amps yeah. through like a Y splitter or whatever you're going to do yeah, exactly. is yeah. like uh, very cool. So it's I'm awesome. sure live that's even more um, impactful. Yeah, it's sweet. And and we have it figured out where, you know, they'll say you we don't have a bass player, but they cover the bass parts. They'll trade off song to song. You yeah. Know, who's covering the low end and who's covering the upper register. Yeah, um, it's a blast, man. And Pat plays slide guitar also, so we have that element to it. And yeah, we we yeah. we're we are on the road basically nonstop. We're you know coming up this fall. I think we're out all of September, October, and November, just all over the country. And we were in Europe twice this year already. We just came back from Italy recently, and so it's yeah, it's crazy. We're we're really busy. Wow, so. that's awesome. But it's good you're. Uh, able to like use i guess whatever downtime you have to like work on books and drumming and and teaching i mean is that do you work on the book on the road or yeah i did i did work on the book on phillyism quite a bit while i was on the road you know listening transcribing and writing um in whatever downtime i had unfortunately i you know i still teach a little bit but because my schedule is so nuts i can't really teach as much i do some virtual lessons yeah um, but yeah i try to make the most of any downtime I have. I also have some side, my own side projects that I, that I do stuff with too. So. Oh, cool. Like yeah. other bands and things around town or. Yeah. Well, I have a, I have a, a trio under my own name. It's called the Tim Carmen trio. Uh, we actually just released our second record. Uh, it's out via F spot records in Los Angeles. It's so the concept for that group, it's, it's a soul jazz group. It's like organ guitar and drums, kind of like a Jimmy Smith, big john Patton hmm. type of type of thing so sure and i get to use some of the, you know some of the concepts that i work on with phillyism and haynesism i can use those in that setting a little bit too which is cool. nice so cool did you go to school like college for drumming or um yeah well 
Yeah, I went to I went to Hamilton College, which is in upstate New York, and I got a degree in music and history there. Okay. So that degree in history definitely helped me with the writing aspect. And gotcha. then after Hamilton, I went to Berkeley uh, just for two years, and I studied. I was doing the performance major, but I essentially started gigging, and it was too expensive, and so I I I left and just started teaching and gigging full time, yeah. pretty much. So. It's almost cooler to drop out than to finish, you know? No, I'm kidding. Everyone who's like on their fourth year is like, dude, don't say that. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, I mean, it's a crazy place. You know? Yeah. It really is. I, I looked at it to go to school. I ended up going for like audio engineer video stuff, but I, yeah. I went to Berkeley and looked and, you know, oh, nice. it, was, it was awesome. Yeah. Just yeah. didn't go that route. I mean, I've, yeah. but uh, it all works out. So totally. I mean, you can, there's a lot to be learned at that school and I hear mixed things from different people, but I think you can get out of it what you put into it for sure. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Awesome, Tim. Well, this is like a really cool episode, man. It's, it's cool to talk about like, uh, a younger guy who's writing all these books, who's a working drummer, who's out there doing it, who's using his spare time, which is not very much to create books for the drum community that's kind of in a history, you know, studying the greats sort of thing. It's it's pretty cool. You're obviously a very busy guy, so uh, I appreciate your time with this. Oh, man. Uh, where can people find you? Let's talk about your social website, all that stuff. Yeah, you can you can go to my website, which is timcarmandrums.com. You can go to my Instagram, which is tcarmandrums, and then head to the GA20 uh, page as well. Um, on any of those pages, you can find my tour schedule. I'm quite busy on the road so definitely come out and say hello um yeah yeah for sure if you come to cincinnati i'm gonna keep an eye on your uh, oh man we'll 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 be in cincinnati soon actually okay cool yeah well then we got to connect man I, that I, would I, be I, awesome i will i need i'm looking for literally any excuse to get out of the house and not yeah. be around kids uh so i will be I, there I, <laughs> we're yeah we're we're gonna be playing uh you know that place motor Oh yeah, I used to play at Motor all the time. So I know there's a place across the street from it that's like Woodward a, Theater. We're playing Woodward Theater. That's what, that coming was, up like in a in a couple weeks. I'll put it on my calendar and I will be there. But um, kind of a side question is: Do you know uh, Coal Mine Records at all? If you're out in Cincinnati, do you know? Why does that? Uh, I'm not sure if I'm familiar with it. My, so cur it's a, it's current record label. It's a record label. That's what uh, GA20 is is on Coal Mine. And I have another really? project coming out next year that's on Coal Mine. And they're based in Loveland, Ohio. So it's, Oh, it's yeah. I've heard close. of them. And don't they have a record shop or something? Yeah, Plaid Room Records. Yep. That's right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Shout out to them. That place is, Plaid Room's awesome. If you, I have if to you go like, out there. Yeah, if you like get buying and shopping for records, check out Plaid Room for sure. Yeah, I've been meaning to go. Um, Loveland's not super far, but there's the mm -hmm. Loveland Castle. If you're ever around there, there's yeah. like a castle you can go to. I just did a photo shoot at that castle. Okay. Yeah, I have a, cool. a project coming out next year called Parlor Greens is the name of the group. Um, it's it's a trio with Jimmy James from Delvon Lamar Organ Trio okay. and this guy Adam Scone on organ. That's going to be good. I'm looking forward to that next year on Coal Mine Records. It's coming out. So. Very cool. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll have to do more, you know, uh, I'll find them on social media and everything. I mean, we're both, we live like 20 minutes. We're 20 minutes yeah. apart. Um, yeah. Are you in Boston now or where are you? Based yeah, out of? I, I live in Western Mass. I'm in Springfield, okay. Massachusetts. So like an hour and a half uh, west of Boston. Okay. Gotcha. Very cool. Yeah. Well, you're always on the road, so it kind of doesn't matter where you, uh, True. <laughs> where you are. So um awesome all right well i will put everything for tim down in the uh, description be sure to check out uh filiasms which is the latest through hudson music you can find it in the description i'll put all of his stuff down there and um i'll be sure to come to your show man at the woodward and awesome uh, looking forward to it hang out there so uh yeah. tim carmen thank you for being here buddy man thank you for having me i appreciate it